The Center for Bright Beams is a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center. We get a large group of people together to work around one big idea. And in our case, the big idea is increasing the brightness of electron beams. It turns out the world's brightest beams are made by the photoelectric effect. So one of the things we're trying to do is understand photo emission. How does it really work? How can we design a photocathode that gives the brightest possible beam? Then we look at the place where the beam is accelerated to light speed and we're looking at new technologies that will enable the use of very high power beams in normal settings, not just at a national lab or a very large facility, but really made accessible. Finally, we're looking at how do you transport those beams. Beams can start really bright and wonderful and then deteriorate as they travel. We're also doing things like applying machine learning techniques in order to tune the many magnets and components of a particle accelerator so that they can all work better and give you a brighter beam where you want it. The Center for Bright Beams has brought together this very dynamic group that is pooling their expertise in order to increase the brightness of electron beams. The Center for Bright Beams needs to bring together material scientists, chemists, engineers, uh, mathematicians all working together. Each of us has our own little niche, but we need to be working together to be able to make any advances. So even though we have a problem that it sounds like it's inherently accelerator physics, to make advances in it, we need people from all sorts of different fields working together on this. I find applications of my research that I never, ever imagined. If five years ago someone had asked me, would you ever have any impact on bright particle beams? I would have said no, that's, that's accelerator physicists, that's high energy physicists, that is not chemistry. And it was only by talking to people about this problem that I learned, hey, there's a lot of surface chemistry in that, there's a lot of chemistry in that, and that's where I can have impact. We are a surface chemistry or surface science group, we're physical chemists. And right now, we are looking at some of the fundamental behavior driving the growth processes of niobium-310, but from a surface science perspective. Current SRF cavities are made of elemental niobium, and this has been the standard for many years. It runs at about two Kelvin for operating conditions, resulting in very expensive and extensive cryogenic infrastructure, which is costly and difficult to maintain. Niobium-310, on the other hand, has a higher critical temperature than elemental niobium and can operate at 4 Kelvin, which is the temperature of liquid helium. As a surface scientist, as a chemist, I was not particularly aware of the exciting research and development that goes on to make these very complex, large facilities or even electron microscopes that you use in the lab or in industry, in medicine. And it's been fascinating to learn about this world that I was unfamiliar with and then understand how I, as a chemist, can fit in with it and bring a specific knowledge base that is useful and different to the equation. The study of materials has uh, reached a point where we can now go atom by atom in, in engineering a, a structure. It's possible with an electron microscope to see individual atoms. You're focusing the beam down to the size of a single atom over the length of about a meter. That would be like hitting a target uh, an inch wide on the moon from the surface of the Earth. It's sort of nuts. The difficulty comes from just the enormous number of moving parts that you have to calibrate precisely in order to you know, hit that tiny target. So at present, these devices are complicated. You have to be specially trained. You need a PhD as a microscopist in order to operate them. But if you were able to tune them algorithmically, automatically, then you could see them more widely deployed in all kinds of industries, in the semiconductor industry, in the manufacturing of batteries, solar cells, any industry that is working on new technology that has to synthesize new materials and needs to be able to verify on the atomic scale that they have achieved the results that they want at high precision. In linear accelerators, such as uh, electron microscopes or free electron lasers, there is a very short time since the electrons are generated to the moment they are used. We are not able to improve the properties of the electron beam beyond the quality it had at the photocathode. We have two ways uh, of improving photocathodes. The first uh, thing we are studying is trying to make them flatter and more homogeneous because flatter and more homogeneous photocathode will have the lowest emittance the material can possibly give. 
And the other thing we are studying is new photocathodes, new material that can produce uh, more uh, collimated electron beams. It is very important for me to exchange ideas and sometimes it's true that if I look too much at the same problem I don't find solution but maybe there is someone else who took a class in a different university and comes from a different field and say oh but we already solved this problem it is like this and that or can tell me oh this problem you are dealing with is very difficult but I can help you out. It's been fabulous to see this group, all different kinds of experts who frankly had never really spoken to each other before, certainly not gathered around a particular project. And now there are dialogues that happen that never could have happened before and are incredibly exciting and productive. It's people from all different fields coming together with our different perspectives, talking about science and realizing how our science can impact other people so it's all about learning new things and having fun with new friends.